Welcome to Sawyer's Church and Summer in the Welcome Psalms. Welcome to Sawyer's Church and Summer in the Psalms. Welcome to Sawyer's Church Online and the Summer of Psalms. And now, now we're over to worship. worship.
morning and welcome to Kids Church. Now in our Bible story today, it says that God's friend were really complaining a lot. God had just freed them from living in a terrible place. God brought them to a new place where they could have a better life. And they thanked God at first, but then they started complaining and complaining. And they complained and, and they complained and they complained some more. God's friends were traveling through the desert. And obviously, when you travel through the desert for a long time, uh, there's no water in the desert. So people, understandably, were getting a bit thirsty. So they complained a lot about that. And, uh, um, you know, asking, like, oh, where are we going to find some place to drink and, and all that? Now, do you complain a lot? What does maybe your mum or dad do when you complain? Now, God's friends were complaining so much. And when they did find a beautiful place with water, they just tasted it, but the water was yucky. Really horrible. The Bible says that God's friend asked God to help with the water. And God showed grace to his friends. They had been complaining so much, but instead of being really annoyed and angry with them, God helped them. He gave them something good when they didn't really deserve it. And that's what I mean when I say God showed grace. It's giving uh, them something good when they kept complaining. They didn't deserve it. So here's how God helped them. God asked his friend Moses to pick up a stick and God said, throw the stick into the water. And he did. And after that, after Moses tossed the stick into the water, into the yucky water, God changed the water and the water was good to drink. God showed grace when he helped his friends. His friends complained and complained, but still God gave them something good. God shows grace to us too. Sometimes we're a bit grumpy, but God still gave us good things. Sometimes we make choices that we know are wrong, but still God forgives us and take care, takes care of us. And that's another way that God shows grace. Can you think of a time when you did something that you knew was wrong? I can think of a few. <laughs> but God forgives us and God forgives you for what we did and you did was wrong. God shows grace to us all at all the time. And we can show grace to others too. We can be kind and helpful to others even if they don't deserve it. Think about uh, uh, times when maybe a friend didn't want to share uh, what they had. Well, maybe you can say something nice or share uh, with them. Or if uh, someone at school was being mean and horrible, well, then maybe you can be kind to them instead of falling into that same trap. If your uh, sister or brother doesn't want to share a snack with you, well, try and show grace and share a snack with them. We can show grace because God shows grace to us. God always gives us good things. It will always give us what's best for us, even when we don't deserve it. And that is God's grace. Have a look on the Resource Centre and I'll see you next week for the last Kids Church Online. Bye! Hi, my name is Peter Jordan. I'm the senior minister here at Soyuz Church. And just to bring you some um, announcements as to what's happening um, here at Soyuz over the course of the, uh, the summer. Um, we do have some events for children and uh, for young people as well. And you can find out more about these uh, through Connect. 
or through the church office. And we have some events for our seniors as well. So um, for details of those, please look at Connect or speak to Jonathan Clayton, our operations manager in the church office. Um, we are obviously watching um, guidelines and, uh, um, uh, and how things are progressing um, as we come out of the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, and um, we are hoping to start fully back um, at Beckett Keys with refreshments after the service and kids church downstairs on Sunday the 12th of September. Um, so we're gearing up towards that. Of course, at the moment, the gathering is meeting um, on a Sunday. You need to book in for that. And uh, as we said before, please, um, you know, if you can maintain social distancing, uh, wear face masks when you arrive and move about. But once you're sitting down for the service, you can take those face masks off. So please um, um, help us with that. But uh, as I say, on the 12th of September, that's when we're looking to get fully back into to, to church with refreshments and uh, kids church um, uh, from then. Well, we're going to show some media now for our offering and uh, please uh, be generous in your giving towards Sawyer's Church. Um, we'll show you how um, you can give um, and how you can make a difference in our town and in our community. And then after that, we have the next instalment of Summer in the Psalms and we're looking forward to that. So God bless you and thank you. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all of this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you placed them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when no one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved, 
and my spirit embittered. I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterwards you will take me into glory. Who am I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail me, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Where do your treasures lie? This is one of my favourite psalms. It is poetic, prophetic and powerful. The psalmist does not hold back at all, but clearly pours his heart out to God the Father. You know, one of the things I've been really enjoying in some of the psalms is really understanding how prophetic all the psalms are. They speak so closely and so directly to the gospel, which I feel is an amazing testament to the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And this morning we'll be exploring Psalm 73 in five parts. First, the acknowledgement of absolute truth. Then, this world of ours. A thief called envy, heavenly perspective, and finally, our hope. So let's start off with the acknowledgement of absolute truth. Verse 1. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. The psalmist leaves absolutely no space for doubt that God is good to his people. This psalm opens with a verse that prophetically speaks to the gospel and is essentially saying that God creates a way, God shares his goodness with those who are considered to, his pe considered to be his people. And what's amazing is that our status as God's people is delivered to us through salvation, through Jesus Christ, who came to earth in human form, all man, all God, to save us from our sins and create a bridge for us to have a relationship, to have communion with the Father. Verse 1 is not only an acknowledgement of this absolute truth, but it acts as a proclamation of it. It's the banner to Psalm 73 and should be the banner to our lives. You know, I strongly believe that this is a great example of how we should approach difficult topics within the church by first acknowledging the absolute truth that God is good to his people, that God created a way for all of us to become his people so that we can share in his goodness. So as we embark today in exploring secular and heavenly perspectives, envy and hope, wrath and grace, as we explore sinfulness and accountability, let's not forget that we discuss those topics within the absolute truth that God is good to his people to those who seek him and to those that who love him. Section two, this world of ours, verse two to verse 12. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. How does that make you think or what does that make you think? My first thought when I read this was, ouch, super judgmental. The psalmist clearly has a strong command over words as he invokes emotions through his poetry. His expression towards God has no restraint whatsoever, which shows his degree of comfort, his security and his relationship with God. But beneath my initial emotion, my initial emotional resistance towards these verses lay truth, which I want to share this morning. And the truth is that I was incredibly nervous 
and unsettled when I first read their characteristics. Pridefulness, violence, sinfulness, evil, malice, arrogance, oppressiveness and wickedness. I saw myself and a number of my flaws in those exact characteristics, particularly pridefulness, sinfulness and arrogance. It made me think back to all the times where I boasted about my own abilities, where I've showed off my showed off my accolades or thought of myself above other people, those who may be poorer than I am, less educated or less privileged. And it troubled me deeply because I thought if this psalmist is talking about people of those characteristics, then I lay squarely in the centre of those people. But I asked myself again, who are these people? Who are the arrogant? Who are the wicked? If I struggle with some of those qualities, is the psalmist speaking about me? Whereas he clearly distinguishes between two sets of people. He distinguishes between the arrogant and the wicked and then the others. And rather than try and answer this question of who fits into which group, let's use the word of God to answer that for us. So if we turn to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom for God, that is, our righteousness, or our right standing with God, our holiness, and our redemption, or our forgiveness and salvation. So let me break this down into steps which made sense in my mind. Because of Jesus, and Jesus alone, we became righteous, holy, and saved. So that means that we are forgiven of our sins and our faults, not because of our own personal qualities and characteristics and abilities, but because of what Jesus did for us. And because we're forgiven for those thoughts, for those faults, this means we are made pure and holy. Or in other words, our slate is wiped clean. So therefore, without Jesus, our sin and our faults remain. Without Jesus, we hold on to our sin. When our hearts are in opposition to God, we're unable to wash away our sinfulness. That is our pride, our lust, our greed, our arrogance. The psalmist is saying in very blunt words, which things which I'm often afraid to say, which I have been too afraid to say, that without Jesus, I am stuck in my sin. Without Jesus, I am an ungodly man. But church, when I don't say this, when I'm ashamed to proclaim this gospel, I am diluting the power and importance of salvation through Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 20. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace must might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This world of ours, I'm constantly challenged to reflect upon my own worldview. I'm hesitant to label the world as sinful in fear of sounding reductive, especially when there's nuance and complexity to each single one of us as individuals. You know, today in secular society, we put ourselves into different groups and attach different labels to ourselves based on our political ideologies, based on our race, based on our sexual attraction, based on our socioeconomic background. It feels incredibly complicated to know where I sit in the middle of this. How do I find a cross section between all these various labels to find my place in society, to find how I distinguish myself in this society? But what this psalm is reminding me, what this psalm is reminding us, is that all of those labels in comparison to our faith are superficial. That isn't to say they're of no importance or of no res relevance, but ultimately this psalm is reminding us that our identity is in Jesus Christ. Our identity is found in the giver of life and salvation. That is what is of eternal importance and that's how the psalmist decides to distinguish between the arrogant and the wicked and others 
And although, you know, in this psalm in particular, this distinguishment actually acts as a stumbling block to the psalmist, as he ends up envying those who don't have an identity in God, it's still an important reminder for us that we must find ourselves in God rather than in this world of ours. Part three, a thief called envy. Verse 13 to verse 16. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings a new punishment. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all of this, it troubled me deeply. Church, this is the point where I encourage everyone to truly be honest with themselves. And I hope that in my honesty, which I show now, it will encourage you to be honest with yourself also. I'm sure we've all heard of President Roosevelt's very famous quote, comparison is the thief of joy. And it turns out that this thief is called envy. The psalmist recognised that there was a difference between those who walked with God and those who didn't. But this is, didn't stop him from envying those who did not walk with God. He says that they have no struggles, they have good health, strength, no burdens, no ills. They have abundance, wealth and possessions of the earth. But he has only affliction and punishments. Now I'm sure those with children hear something familiar to this every day. And I'm sure my parents have, because I remember what teenage Finn sounded like. Mom, Dad, you never let me do anything. You know, all I ever do is stay at home. I have nothing in my life. Why all my friends, they're living their best life. You know, this person over here, you just got a new bike, or this person just got a new Xbox, or a new PlayStation, and a car, and I have nothing. I'm just at home. The psalmist was experiencing what George Orwell would call double think. George Orwell introduced this concept in his famous book, 1984, and it's essentially when you have two contrary beliefs while believing them both to be real and true at the same time. For example, this famous slogan, war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. The psalmist said that he has God, he has the great power, the creator of the universe, that I am and they do not. While he's also saying that he has less in comparison to those people. Now this may sound really silly or really obvious, but I know that I fall into this trap often. Though I truly believe in God and salvation through Jesus, I slip into temptation of envy and believing that I lack. I put my hands up. When I was at university, I enjoyed going out with my friends. But maybe not for the reasons you might think. I lived in a house with five guys, four of whom played for the first basketball team, and one of them was called Guido. Now, before me and Guido would go to the student union, which is you know, on campus where the students would go out on a Wednesday and Saturday night, um, we would always decide between ourselves what takeaway are we going to get on the way home? Which might sound odd for two athletes, but we'd always decide, you know, are we going to go to McDonald's, Burger King, are we going to get pizza or Domino's, or are we going to go to the kebab shop on the way home? And we always decided on going to the greasiest, dirtiest place in Bath called Al Falafels. So what would happen is we'd go out, probably get to the student union around 11.30 and as soon as the clock struck 12.30, I'd check my phone, check my watch. I'd look at Guido and he'd be looking at me from across the room and we'd just smile at each other. And we'd know we'd fulfilled our one hour social obligation to go out and it was time to get food. So we'd get food, you know, I would always get my classic, which would be, um, wings and chips and Guido would always get his classic which was donna meat with mayo and barbecue sauce but anyway what's what's the relevance to this story so after the food sent me to bed at around 2 30 i wake up to my alarm at 9 a.m on a sunday and it'd be time to go to church so i'd get up you know go to church while the rest of the student community in bath would be fast asleep 
until maybe midday on Sunday. And I distinctly remember thinking to myself multiple times, oh, imagine if I didn't have to go to church on a Sunday morning. Imagine if I just got to lie in, I'd have so much more free time. I'd wake up at 11, maybe do a fry up, put my feet up, read a book. But on reflection, my heart envied those who did not go to church, but also believing that I was on my way to go and praise the creator of the universe. How often have we envied free time over time with God? You know, for me, envy has many different faces. Sometimes I fall into the trap of envying people my age, in better jobs, earning more money, more prestigious firms, with better physiques, performing better in academia than me. I've envied those who've got more likes on their pictures on social media, who have more followers. And I'm not proud to say it, but often my response to seeing other people doing better than I people who have more than I do, is envy. While also somehow believing that I have the greatest treasure in this earth by a country mile. By having relationship with God and salvation through Jesus Christ. And those feelings when allowed to harbour and go unchecked, they lead to my bitterness towards other people and discontentment with my own life and my blessings. Envy causes me to lose perspective, especially when I envy materialistic and worldly things. Envy of this world and its possessions is a clear symptom of a bigger problem in our hearts. It's deeper than just petty jealousy or competitiveness. It highlights the misplacement of our focus and desire, and ultimately, the misplacement of our heart. Heavenly perspective, verse 17 to verse 20. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Till I enter the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Church, when we dwell in the presence of God, then we will be given the eternal perspective that we need to navigate this world. James 4.14 paraphrased, For what is our life? It is a vapour which appears for a moment and vanishes away. This life is a shadow of the next, of the next, a mere breath and it is brief. But because of Jesus, we are gifted eternal life. We receive the promise that one day we will dwell in the presence of his goodness. All suffering and sin will cease and we will experience perfect unity with God. This is kingdom perspective, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. I know that if I held this treasure in the highest regard, it would change the way I lived my life and change the way I viewed the world. My envy of fleeting things of this earth would cease in the presence of eternal perspective. I would be desperate for all my friends and family to partake in this with me. I would desperately want them to have this treasure and share in the goodness of God. Church, let's get excited about Alpha for this exact reason. Let's invite people and share this treasure. As Val said a few weeks ago, Let's challenge ourselves to invite at least three people to Alpha this September. I know as Christians, it's easy to hold on to the treasure of salvation for ourselves and get comfortable. But let's not rob those around us of this great news that we have of salvation through Jesus Christ. 
Let's share this treasure as God's love abounds for us. He abounds for his people. An excellent role model of someone who always maintained this heavenly perspective was the Apostle Paul. In all his epistles, he references his desire to be with God. He reminds the church to eagerly await Jesus and his second coming, to eagerly await the desires and riches of heaven, of complete relationship with the Father. He writes to the church in Philippi, Philippians 3, 20 to 21. But our citizenship in heaven, not on earth, our citizenship, apologies, our citizenship is in heaven, not on earth. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. It is too easy to lose heavenly perspective and get distracted in the day-to-day of our lives. We live in a world set up to keep us busy, to keep us distracted. I mean, has everyone, anyone ever used TikTok before? We have jobs, we have families, hobbies, social media, expectations, deadlines, commitments, and in all that chaos, it's easier to hold on to the possessions of this world and place them in greater esteem than God himself. Church, Jesus spoke of a parable in Matthew 13, 44, which reads, The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Church, I want to be more like that man. Who upon realising that he found the ultimate treasure, upon realising that he found Jesus, he found salvation through Jesus Christ. He found a God who loves him and cherishes him and cares for him and created a way to have perfect relationship with him. Upon finding that all out, he joyfully sold all possessions of this earth. He lay waste to the possessions of this world because he knew that he had found the richest treasure, the greatest treasure. He sold everything he had to go and buy that field. In context, in comparing what he had, look, comparing what he had with the treasure of heaven, happily, he cast one aside. Church, that's always been a very personal challenge for me. You know, if I truly believe in the gospel, if I truly believe what I say, that I believe that God sent his son to create a way for me to have perfect relationship with him so that one day I could share in his goodness. If I truly, truly believe that with every vessel, with every cell in my body, would that change the way I live my life? Would that change the way I viewed other things? Would I envy jobs would i envy jobs where we work for 40 years in our life in comparison to eternity would i share the gospel more freely would i be desperate for my friends to know the gospel would i still hold so tightly to the things of this world or would i joyfully cast that aside leave it all on the side for jesus leave it all on the side for my faith because that is where my joy is found. That is where my heart is found. Our hope. Final section. Stay with me. Verse 21 to 28. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by your right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish, and you destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds." our hope. There isn't much to add 
which has already been said, which hasn't already been said. Church, where do our treasures lie? I know that when my heart is rooted in things of this earth, it's easy to be filled with envy and jealousy, to fall into that temptation and forget that I partake, that we partake in the good news. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasures are, there your heart will be also. And I can boldly say for myself that I want my heart to be with God. I want my life to reflect this truth. In order for me to do that, I must fix my eyes and heart on Jesus and eagerly await him. And for me, this could look like daily prayer, it could look like journaling or writing to God. It could be meditating on his word. I know my dad preached on this a couple of weeks ago in Psalm 1. Just thinking about God, about what heaven will look like. I want to look forward to the day where all of God's people will be made perfect in him. So this week, spend time and ponder on your perspective. Allow the Holy Spirit to convict you in the areas of your life where you're filled with envy, where you're impacted by the temptation of envy. And church, let's think about where our treasures lie. Let's be proactive in making sure that our most valued treasure is Jesus Christ. Oh